So if we think about the oocyte from the ovary being released into the peritoneal cavity, then we continue the discussion with the uterine tubes. This is kind of the next area that we're moving into. And oftentimes you'll hear uterine tubes referred to as fallopian tubes. As discussed in previous courses, we're moving away from eponyms, but a lot of times clinically you'll still hear the term fallopian. Now the uterine tubes are about 10 centimeters each one. And similar to what we had with the ovaries, you do have an association with the broad ligament of the uterus. But what's unique about the uterine tubes is this portion of the broad ligament, the mesosalpinx, uh, this is actually going to completely surround the uterine tube. So this is really the only pelvic organ of the female that's going to be considered intraperitoneal. And that makes sense. If you think about the oocyte being released into the peritoneal cavity, you're going to need a structure that's completely within the peritoneum to really kind of get that back into heading towards the uterus. So the main function is to transport that secondary oocyte or the fertilized ovum, which typically actually occurs in a portion of the uterine tube. So fertilization often occurs in what we refer to as the ampulla of the uterine tube. Now let's start with the most lateral portions of the uterine tube, and this is referred to as the infundibulum. And there's two main areas that I want to talk about when we're talking about the infundibulum. So let's kind of get organized in terms of where we are at in this picture. Here is the uterus here, the ovary is here, and then this structure right here, this is the uterine tube. And you can see it's really uh, very tightly surrounded by that peritoneum. So the most lateral portion is referred to as the infundibulum. This is opening into the peritoneal cavity at what we refer to as the abdominal ostium, so the opening. And what else is unique, and you can kind of see this in these images, are these finger-like projections that are, open, that are surrounding that abdominal ostium, which we refer to as fimbriae, or fimbriae, you'll hear it either way. And that's, they are exactly what they look like. They're finger-like projections that will kind of move in order to get the oocyte into the uterine tube. And these will actually engorge during ovulation in order to allow for that closer association with the oocyte. There's one actual fimbriae that actually attaches to the ovaries. The rest are just right around it. Now as we move more medially or towards the uterus, you have the longest portion of the uterine tube and that is the ampulla. And the ampulla is going to be the most typical site of fertilization. So that is where the sperm meets the oocyte and then you have the formation of the zygote. This will continue into what's referred to as the isthmus, so kind of the narrowest portion of the uterine tube. And this is where you're going to have the joining to the uterus into the uterine cavity here, or the lumen of the uterus. So that's where you can have implantation typically occurs within the uterine cavity. Now every once in a while, the ampulla, like I said, is going to be the most typical place for fertilization. Occasionally this can actually occur in the peritoneal cavity as well. You do have a small portion of the uterine tube referred to as the uterine part that is continuous with the myometrium of the uterus. Now there's three main layers and we're going to talk about the first two because they're probably the two most important. The mucosa are going to have associated cilia associated with the cells and what it does is it works as almost a conveyor belt to move the oocyte from the abdominal ostium towards the lumen or the uterine cavity. So those cilia, those little kind of hair-like projections of the cells will move it down or move it more medially. And then the muscularis layer, which is the middle layer of the uterine tube, will ser serve a similar function in the fact that it will have peristaltic contractions that will move the oocyte towards the uterine cavity as well. And that serosa, as we know, this is going to be very closely associated with the peritoneum. So we've moved um, the oocyte from the ovary into the peritoneal cavity. It will move through the uterine tube 
and then it will be within the uterine cavity. Now, depending on whether it has been fertilized or not, that will change the structure of what's going to happen within the uterus quite dramatically. So let's continue our discussion with the structures and the function of the uterus.